We left off last time talking about some of the structure. So, so we, we've, we've been talking up to this point mostly about some of the properties of our global ocean. And uh, we've started getting to the, to the um, discussion of a few elements. We don't have time to spend. This isn't an oceanography course, so we can't go through all the neat things that happen. But at least touching upon some of the key manifestations of those different uh, physical uh, components of the ocean. And so, so we just started talking about, we'll, we'll go back here and review this, this notion of um, different structure in the ocean brought about by, for example, different densities of the water, different, different masses of water. And one of those that we see most clearly uh, are thermoclines. Again, Klein is, is, a, is a rapid change and thermo, in this case, referring to temperature, but there's all kinds of potential uh, uh, clines in the ocean. So what I'm showing you guys here is this is a cartoon picture. Uh, again, here's a boat. And you can imagine we've dropped off a, um, a leaded line. And we have, so this goes from the surface all the way down to the bottom. So this is a nice straight taut thing. And every so often, we've put a thermometer. This is before, you can, this is very easy to do. This is how people did this before we had electronics and things like that, right? So as you know, some thermometers are just thermometers. Other thermometers have max and min levers. So we could put this down, and if it is, I don't know, whatever, 70 degrees at the surface, or is it Celsius? If it's, uh, if it's 30 degrees or 40 degrees at the surface here, um, we could maybe use the minimum uh, mark, a, a, a minimum temperature marker on this thermometer, and throw these guys overboard. Mm -mm -mm -mm. Leave this under water for a certain amount of time for the thermometer to equilibrate and, and do all that kind of stuff. So uh, it'll it'll go to whatever the temperature is around it and the surrounding water bodies, and then we'll pull this back up on the boat and check it out. And so that's how we can record temperature. Obviously, there's many other ways to do this as well, but this is. For illustrative purposes, you guys can get the idea here. And so what we saw was near the surface, it was hot. As we said last time, also let me just reiterate, low to high, a typical x-axis. The y-axis with these ocean uh, things plotted relative to the surface of the ocean, we typically go from, as opposed to a low number to a high number, a uh, low number to a high number. So going down into, going, um, Towards the bottom of this figure, the depth is increasing, the value is increasing, which is a bit strange for most of our default graph shapes, uh, our graph formats. Anyway, okay, here we go. So we have uh, relatively warm water, go down a little bit, still basically the same, not, not a massive difference in temperature. Go a little bit farther, not a massive difference in temperature. And then we hit, uh, and then let's say if we were way down deep, same thing. If we we're here, it would be some temperature, we go slightly different depth, basically the same temperature, slightly different depth, basically same temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then we hit this area where there's this rapid change. And I mentioned last time, I told you guys a story about um, uh, how I would warm my hands up in the cove at Catalina, just put my hands up higher, and even just you know a couple feet can make a huge difference. Um, and we talked about the fact that uh, these are real barriers to things like gelatinous zooplankton that for us might, you know, one one chunk of water that's 20 degrees and one chunk of water that's 10 degrees might not seem like that big a difference. It can be huge to a lot of these ocean dwelling creatures. In, ge in general, uh, there can be lots of small scale structure, let's say in the temperature as we go from the surface to the bottom. But generally, and then there is, and, and, and there, there can be a lot of uh, changes here. But generally we have something that's strongly influenced by the surface of the ocean, by the sun striking the top bit of the uh, surface of the ocean, by winds blowing on the ocean, that kind of stuff, maybe mixing some of the water, that type of stuff. And then we have the stuff that's way down deep, that's very, that it's not uh, easily affected by a passing hurricane or something of that nature. And we have this in-between layer. This in-between layer is, you can think of it as basically where that thermocline, where, where that rapid cline is. So we have the not changing very much, 
changing a lot or, or at least very responsive to the surface waters and then this intermediary um, uh, change. And again, while at Catalina, the warmest time of the year is right now in the water by far, because we've been warming up these shallow waters, warming up these shallow waters, warming up these shallow waters for quite a, you know, since, sp since spring. Once we have that first big storm, winter storm, it's gonna come in, bring in some swell and really mix up the shallow surface water. That's gonna really, ch that's gonna dramatically, for example, make the water temperature much colder. Um, but even with that, even with that, those, those big storms and, and, and that the fact that this temperature might be changing a little bit from season to season, it's not radically going to change the stuff that's more like a kilometer and deeper down into the ocean. Much more persistent, much less heterogeneous down here, uh, at least over a time scale. Um, yeah, so, so this... This climb, this global change as we go from the shallows to the deep is most pronounced, uh, if we're talking about temperature at least, is most, most pronounced in terms of the tropics. And that makes sense, right? That's where the sun is beating down the most intense, most consistently. The polar regions, that's where the sun and the heat is, is not massively, massively different from peak summer to peak winter. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, right. So we know that. So again, so this shallow water stuff is variable. Again, dictated by the goings on of the stuff outside of the water. Down deep, deeper than about a kilometer or so, is pretty consistent. Normal or, 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 or traditionally, since we're surface dwellers, and we get at the ocean from the surface. And because there's so much productivity in the surface waters, uh, a lot of times you'll see people talk about the surface temperature of the ocean, typically referred to as SST or sea surface temperature, as, as the most common way we talk about temperature. I've just been talking to you about the three-dimensionality of temperature into the ocean. Usually, though, this is how we see it represented surface waters most typically and we can go out there and just measure it again with a with a thermometer if we, if we want that that's cool but most typically these days we measure sea surface temperature through satellites and so that's going to mean that we're only really going to encounter we're only going to really measure i should say the temperature in the top really it's top few inches but definitely no deeper than say a meter or or thereabouts so this is really just the the thinnest most skin covering of the ocean and so that's what we're showing here and again we've already seen this but but uh the tropics obviously has the most consistent uh highest uh incident uh incidence of um radiation and so this is going to be the warmest as you guys know that's why people go to vacation in the tropics and as we go farther away we get into the subtropics and the temperate and then the polar areas uh, as we've already seen from, for example, some of our, uh, when we're talking about um, silicaceous ooze and exciting stuff like that, um, note that it's not, it's not a pink band across the tropics and then a yellow band consistently across, uh, say, Central America and, and Australia, etc. There is structure to this, and that is because we have these, sur these surface currents. And so... Uh, as we'll talk about in a second, um, we have surface waters moving this way and then going up. So this is tending to bring warm water, bathe this part of Japan in warm water, and then keeping up that, that, that large-scale spinning, that large-scale gyre. Um, then we get up here, and now the water is cooling, cooling, cooling. It's relatively cool water. Now as it runs down the coast, uh, we have cool coasts, right? That's why our friends from North Carolina and stuff like that go out in the water and it's hot. It's hot at the same latitude. And if we come over here to California and get in the water, all these tourists come from the East Coast and they go, I'm going to go in the ocean. And they go, what? It's freezing cold. It's summertime. You people are crazy, right? 
That's because we are experiencing being bathed in, in cool, more polar waters, whereas the east coast of our country, the, the east coast of the, the continental east, um, is being bathed in warm, tropical waters, generally speaking. Okay, let's see what that looks like in real time. And so this is what we see. So again, this is just sea surface temperature. So obviously we can see the warm tropics doing their deal. But um, in this case, we're going through seasons. And so we see there's some pulsing. There's, there's some expansion or contraction of the warm waters. You know, so the warmth kind of goes a little more north. Warmth goes a little more south. And if we stop this for a second, um, what we're seeing here is, um, uh, again, here we have this polar water coming down, getting tugged down here. And so what otherwise might be warmer waters off of our coast is cooler. And we're starting to see some of this structure show up. And we're also seeing cool tongues and things propagate um, across the Pacific, etc. And we can see all this microstructure. Can you guys see this? So these little teeny, t and the, this, this is, this is, you know, this is uh, each, each step here is, I don't know, three weeks or I can't remember what it was, but it was, this is obviously really, this is, this is, you know, a couple years condensed into a few seconds, but you can see that there's these, there's lots of microstructure here, lots of little eddies, but even with all of those eddies and everything, look, we still have the warm water uh bathing up whoosh, there it goes tongues right up the J japanese coast okay a little about temperature a little bit about light another key thing we need to mention about water is uh, we obviously one of the reasons life exists here on earth is because of our beautiful sun and that light is going to be the foundation. We'll, we'll hear in a little bit about, about other communities in our ocean and planet that are built on things other than light, but the vast majority of, of the biomass and the biodiversity we have on our Earth is getting its energy directly or indirectly from the sun. So the depth at which light penetrates, the depth at which it's possible for photosynthetic organisms to maintain a net positive uh, photosynthetic balance to, to fix more sugars than they consume from that electromagnetic radiation and convert that into chemical uh, energy. Um, we call that the photic zone and then the area below that the aphotic zone. So the light penetrating zone and the non-lit zone. Obviously, how much crud is in the water is going to strongly affect how deep light is going to penetrate into the ocean. The two largest sources of turbidity, and turbidity, just turbid, that just means uh, hard to see through, basically. The two most common sources of turbidity are, one, sediments in the water column itself, and that could be caused because, let's say, a storm comes and kicks up some sand and, and makes that sand that was settled out to the bottom be suspended up in the water column. Can come from sediments rushing out of river mouths, uh, what have you. So classically, has anybody been in the water recently off of our coast? So how far, how far could, did you guys put a mask on? Could you, did, were you surfing? Oh, we're just surfing, see, Pete and I see. Has anybody had, the, has anybody had a mask on on their face? in the last year off our coast? I'll say it that way. Yes. Yes. Okay, so what was the visibility like off our coast? Horrible. Okay, so, so you say it is horrible in Santa Rosa, but Santa Rosa is going to be way better than the coast. So the mainland, you know, what do we see? Maybe 30 feet, 30 feet, 20 feet, right? We have a lot of, so 90, what is it? 96% of Ventura County coast is Sandy Beach which is awesome for going to the beach, that means that there's a lot of sediments going into the water. So we have a very um, uh, low vis type of coastline here. If we go out to the Channel Islands, which are generally 
much rockier, less sandy, less sedimenty along the coastline. The visibility is much better than, on average than on the mainland. If we go even farther offshore, if we got in a boat and went to, say, we're on our way to Santa Barbara Island, which is 60 miles off our coast, and you know, got 30 miles out and put a mask on and jumped in the water, we'd see really far. And that's uh, because of, um, in, our, in our case, um, soil broken down sediments. In other parts of the world, that comes from animal-derived sediments, uh, from coral and stuff, but sediments. Okay, so one is sediments. The other is are, the other are little microscopic critters that could be in the water column scattering light just like particles of sediment might be scattering light. And so the classic case of this would be a phytoplankton bloom. And while these can appear seasonally, these are most often seen in consistent areas with upwellings. And we'll talk about upwellings in a little bit. Light penetration decays exponentially with death. It's not a linear relationship. So it disappears very, very quickly into the ocean. And as you can see here from this uh, figure I've put in, light does not disappear equally. So light, the light that we see from the sun is white light, which we know is, is um, different wavelengths, different uh, uh, electromagnetic radi radiation at different um, uh, yeah, wavelengths. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Um, and so uh, just like you take a prism, if you, so in other words, if you take a prism, we hold up to the sun, we see the nice rainbow. Same thing happens when that light hits the ocean. In this case, some things drop out very, very quickly. Other things per, uh, survive deeper. The very first thing that drops out is red light. So if you were to cut your hand, uh, probably none, none of you guys, I have done this because that's just how I roll, but, but you guys probably haven't. But if you cut your hand down at about 100 feet, 120 feet, and you look down at your hand, it doesn't look red. Well, may, well, if you had a flashlight, maybe it would. But if, if, we're just, if we're just on our own, light's still penetrating. I can still see there's fish and there's this and that. But my hand, it, it would look weird, greenish, darkish. It wouldn't look red. And that's because uh, all the red light that came from the sun has not um, penetrated to that depth. And so you guys know that when we see red, what's actually happening? We have a bunch of, say, white light from the sun. It's hitting whatever the red thing is, right? And that, that, that's allowing that, those red wavelength light waves to go back up to your eyeballs. Other, thing, other colors are not reflected back, but the red is. So therefore, um, yeah, okay, right. So, so red drops out first then orange, then yellow, and purple, and then green, and then blue. So blue survives the deepest. So the one color we're able to see most consistently is, uh, until we can't see anything, is blue. Now, if we went down, let's, now let's say I'm bleeding down here at, I don't know what I'm at, 100 feet, this depth. My hand wouldn't, my, my, my cut hand wouldn't look red. But if I then took my flashlight out, and turn my flashlight on and shine it on my hand, it would look red. Because now I'm reintroducing white light at this point, right? And it, that makes sense, everybody? Everybody with me? So this is why when you watch these great old Jacques Cousteau movies and stuff, things look a little, eh, they look a little kind of greeny blue. Or if you look at an old National Geographic, the coral reefs, they, 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 you know, the structure looks cool, the fish looks cool, look cool, but they don't pop. They don't, like the, the oranges aren't crazy hot orange. The yellows aren't crazy hot yellows, right? So one of the big advances in terms of, for example, communicating to the general public about life underwater, one of the big advances was uh, one film technology that was more sensitive to different colors, but then also more importantly, illumination technology, lighting technology. And so, you know, when I was doing my PhD and trying to light stuff up even... You know, I'm not that old, but even, even just a few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, 
we had to bring these huge bricks, these huge massive light sources down to illuminate stuff, even for only a, a short period of time, maybe only 45 minutes or so. Um, okay, right. So there we go. So light disappears. <clears throat> Any questions about that? Make sense? Everybody with me on that one? Okay, great. Next one we should talk about is pressure. So we have all these water molecules, and they're water molecules on top of water molecules on top of water molecules, and that's a lot of stuff. That's a lot of mass. We describe, by definition, at, at sea level, the amount of pressure that your body is experiencing, that my body is experiencing, is um, equivalent to 14, a, a bit more than 14 pounds per square inch, but that doesn't matter. We just call that one atmosphere, one standard atmosphere worth of pressure. So the, you, can, you can think of it as the weight of all the air from the surface of the ocean all the way up to the top of our atmosphere, call it 100 kilometers if you want. All of that weight squeezing down on us is one atmosphere's worth of pressure. Water is obviously much denser than air. So therefore, um, when we go into the ocean, that's why we feel a little squeezed. That's why when we get in the water, we feel like we're, almost like we're being hugged a little bit by the water. And then as we go into the water, we need only go uh, uh, just about 33 feet or 10 meters deep to double the amount of pressure that our body is experiencing. So, 30, so 10 meters of water equals 100 kilometers of air. And then every subsequent 10 meters that we go down into the ocean is another atmosphere's worth of pressure. So I mentioned that light disappears exponentially. Depth accumulates, or excuse me, pressure accumulates linearly with depth. So it's the same amount. It's it's as we go deeper. It's 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 additional, additional. Um, so what that means is, if we were at I don't know 300 meters and went to 310 meters, that would be yet another atmosphere's worth of pressure, but it wouldn't feel massively different to you and I. We'd either be crushed already, or we'd be okay. Realize the greatest change, the greatest pressure differential in the ocean goes, it happens in the very, very shallows, right? So here at, say, 20 meters, we're at three atmospheres worth of pressure. By going up even that, just that same amount, that 10 meters, we're going to reduce the amount of pressure on us by one third. If we go from 10 meters to zero, we're going to have the pressure. So while pressure is linear, the greatest rate of change is going to happen right here at the surface. Proportional, excuse me, the greatest proportion change is happening right at the surface. Okay. Why do we care? We care because you and I are air breathers. You and I have these big things in our chest called lungs that operate based on atmospheric pressure. And because we've evolved on land, we're not used to dealing with uh, water and things of this nature. <clears throat> and any other critter that is an air breather, surface breather, has to deal with this as well. So whales and the deepest diving uh, marine uh, you know, pinnipeds that we have, uh, um, northern elephant seals, are insane. I mean, the, the physiology that their body goes through to go from the shallow down to the deep, and not just go down, like some crazy extreme athlete, I'm gonna go down, and I'm gonna go. these things are going down and foraging, and hunt, actively hunting for prey, locating prey, finding prey. Sometimes they're sleeping underwater. I mean, crazy stuff, amazing stuff. So we're, I'm illustrating that here uh, with a balloon. So here this guy is in this boat. He's blown up his balloon at uh, the surface of the ocean, and it's whatever the size it is. And now we, we've, we've gone in and we've tied off the bottom of that balloon, 
and we've sealed it off. So now it's, it's rubber and, and there's no uh, gas exchange between the inside of the balloon and the outside of the balloon. There we go. Great. Um, now, if I hand it to my, my friend, the diver, and she swims down here and she goes to uh, 10 meters, the diameter of that balloon will be exactly half. Right? And so as we go deeper and deeper, the balloon gets smaller and smaller. Again, the greatest proportional change is right here at the surface. But as we go down deeper and deeper and deeper, eventually we get something that is, you know, it looks, non it looks like an empty balloon. Why? Because we have the same amount of air molecules in here as we do down here. Here at this pressure, the air molecules can bump out and resist and they're at the same um, at the same pressure as the stuff around them. Down here as we go down, there's way more squeezing, way more squeezing from all the surrounding uh, matrix of, of matter around it. And uh, because it's twice as much pressure that the guys inside have, you know, can't work, can't exert a counteracting balance and so they're essentially collapsed so, so, so that volume is reduced and the same thing happens to your lungs for example so if we start right here at the surface and you take a gulp of air and hold it and then sw swim down into the water uh, your your lungs will be getting squeezed squeeze 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 so these extreme divers these guys that do this insane free diving um, they have to they practice a lot and um, there's all there's yeah yeah, okay, anyway. So in addition to that, in addition to the, the air, for those of us that have air spaces in our bodies, um, this also affects all kinds of physiological goings on. So when we get really deep into the ocean, the pressure can actually affect how some proteins fold and potentially in turn have the Q10 and, and the physiological rate at which processes happen inside mm -hmm inside our bodies and stuff. So there's pressure is, is a non-trivial thing. Um, generally speaking, most things that are down deep live down deep. And most things that are up in the shallows live up in the shallows. It is the rare, it is the relatively rare critter that can go from the surface to thousands of meters down very quickly and, and rapidly and routinely. Okay. Continuing on with our whirlwind tour here. Um, this is what the Earth would look like if the Earth was not spinning. This is what our, our atmosphere would be doing. Uh, here's the north, here's the south. We'd have the sun beating down on the equator, generally speaking, making this air, these air molecules, let's say, hotter. As they get hotter, as we've known from our, one of our previous lectures, they're, they're, things are less dense. So they tend to rise. They tend to bloop, go up. Over here, in the poles where we get the least amount of incident sunlight, it's relatively cool. And so there, stuff, when, it, when air molecules get up to here, it's, it's relatively cold, they're relatively dense, they tend to sink. This would be what, oops, sorry. This would be what we get. Very simplified air, air going from the poles to the uh, excuse me, from the tropics to the poles up high in the atmosphere and going from the poles to the equator down low and those winds would be strong. So very simplified. But our Earth is spinning. So we have this cool thing called the Coriolis effect or the Coriolis of for force. It's an apparent force. It's not a real force. It seems as if this is happening when it isn't really. And this is when people talk about the, you know, that toilet bowl, like when you go down Australia and the toilet flushes the other direction, right? And it's, right, that, it's not that, but people think it's that. <laughs> it was first described uh, with our current understanding um, almost 200 years ago by uh, this really smart Frenchman, and he gave us the name Coriolis. So have a look at the, well, okay. So this is classic Coriolis. The Earth is spinning. The air molecules and the water molecules for that. The same thing happens with water and air, but let's just let's stick with air for now. 
The air molecules are not, I know this is, a, this is amazing, the air molecules are not attached to the earth. So as the earth is rotating, as the earth is spinning underneath us, the air is, is you know, kind of moving also, but it's not moving at the same, it's not, it's not identically moving with the hard part of the earth. And this is what's going on. To an observer above the merry-go-round, the path of the ball appears straight, while to someone sitting on it, the ball appears to curve to the left. This exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby, to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is a result of the Earth's rotation. Does that make sense? Let's watch that again. So the ball, the, we start the video looking straight down, the ball doesn't change. We've moved the ball, we've made the air mass start to move it'll it so the air is doing the thing the air is doing but for those of us that are attached to the rock or in this case the merry-go-round it seems as if we threw the thing and then it had an apparent force and it moved so let's watch that again to an observer above the merry-go-round the path of the ball appears straight while to someone sitting on it the ball appears to curve to the left this exemplifies the Coriolis force, whereby, to an observer on the rotating Earth, the path of an object appears to be deflected, and this is a result of the Earth's rotation. Okay, so what's going to tend to happen is this. So here we go. Here's our starting, um, our starting point. And our air is going from um, a high pressure to a low pressure area, as it's wont to do. And so the air is going to go the course of the wants to go the course of this yellow line. It's just going to go along the, these clines of pressure. But because we're moving underneath it, the Earth is spinning. Okay, so here the Earth is spinning. So a, as the uh, air molecule is moving this way, it's going to appear as it's going to look to be bending, right? It's going to look to be deflecting. So before, I mentioned that if the Earth was not rotating, we'd have this air just going up and down like this. That's not what happens. What happens is the air moves and uh, it is bent. How is it bent? It hitchhikes with its right hand. That's how you should remember this, okay? So you can imagine if you guys are hitchhiking, I'm sure... Well, I don't know if you, I shouldn't say that'll probably get me in trouble. But anyway, so so um, you're not supposed to hitchhike because it's dangerous and stuff. But um, anyway, if you were to go hitchhiking, if you're to watch a movie from the 70s, let's say, what you do is you stand by the side of the road and you put your 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 thumb out like this, right? So your thumb is pointing up to the sky. So that's what you should use to figure out how the Coriolis effect goes. So you're right-handed. Sorry, lefties, but you're right-handed. Thumb is sticking out, and that's going to be where it's going to go. So we can imagine if our arm is the wind, okay, and we're going from our shoulder to our hand, the deflection is going to be to our, our right thumb, okay? There we go. All right, and so what that's going to essentially do is create all this really cool structure in our, our in this case, winds. And this is the handout I, I gave you guys at the start of the, of the lecture. So what I'm representing to you here is, here's the Earth, and then this is, this is a sort of cartoony cross-section of the atmosphere. Um, the uh, uh, hotter colors show warming, the darker blue is cooling. And so uh, what we're seeing is these so-called circulation cells. incredibly important hard to underestimate how important this has been for our society right this was key to the Polynesians colonizing the South Pacific key to the Europeans coming over to the Americas key to the the colonial trade between imperial powers and colonized areas and it just goes on and on and on today this is still important. Uh, most typically, you hear about the jet stream 
and how that messes with weather patterns, how that how planes will take advantage of the jet stream when they're flying from, you know, Asia to North America, etc. And so what we're seeing here is in effect different air masses. Um, uh, because we hit a maximum deflection of uh, or excuse me, maximum curvature of the Coriolis effect such that eventually the air is going to be moving parallel to the equator. So that's why we get these cutoff cells. So right at the equator, we have uh, no net air movement uh, up or down, or excuse me, north or south. It's just sort of going straight up. And we have the winds in this this area are known as the westerlies. The winds and and sorry in both parts of the globe are known as the westerlies. And then the the chunks of air mass closer to the equator are known as known as the trade winds. So you could, if you were a sailor, let's say back in the day before you had uh, uh, diesel-powered shipping, you knew that in some cases you would. You would sail to this uh, area, let's say in Africa or off Africa, and you would and you would go across, right, to the Caribbean. Or when you're coming back, you would come up to this area and, and go across. So, so you could use this to figure out um, to aid your to speed your travel by weeks, and you knew the areas to avoid that were the so-called doldrums, that were the areas with, on average, very little. Uh, consistent wind one way or the other. So you guys have this handout. You guys should go over this. But basically we have um, uh, these different circulatory cells. And um, this, to explain what this guy is, so this is, again, in a two-dimensional illustration, it's kind of hard. But we have these, these air uh, masses moving. And then the area between these polar cells and these temperate cells this is known as the jet stream. And so, so what this minus is supposed to show is in this case, the way it's, it's falling out right here, the, the winds are moving into the screen right here in this illustration, into the screen. And here, if I'd had, a plot, if I'd had another sign here, they'd be moving out of the, so they're, they're, they're coming out and going around, coming out. So the jet stream goes like this, right? Cool. Mm -hmm. Is there like a specific size that they normally see? Like um, so they might, they might fluctuate a little. So for example, the jet, the jet stream will bump up and down, but they're generally between 30 and 60 degrees. The, the um, um, westerly cells, the temperate cells above us, are generally between 30 and 60 and 30 and about 10. Okay, so, so generally speaking, what's going to be happening is if we're in this area of Africa, generally the winds are going to be going fr from my cursor this way. Yeah. So you're going to be going uh, towards the equator. When we get to about here, the winds are generally going along the equator. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so it, it, it's, not, it's, it's a whole three-dimensional thing. It's not, it's not like this. I mean, this is a cartoon representation. So if we were up in this area, the winds are generally moving uh, along the 30th parallel uh, uh, eastward. And if we're down over here, they're generally going westward. So now, so n note that the winds are named after the directions they're going in. And so, and so these were named from our European heritage. So generally, folks from Europe, when they wanted to go west, they hit these. Because the strongest winds are going to be these guys down near the, down near the, or closest to the ocean. And those are generally going to be going west, right? The strongest ones will be going west. When they wanted to come back and they'd, they'd collected all the stuff they'd traded for, they're going to come catch these trade winds and they're going to go back. So, so these names come from the fact that these guys were mostly interested, they're mostly guys, and they're mostly interested in this spot, right? And so, so by just being a few hundred miles, potentially, 
here versus here, they're totally different movement patterns. But realize as we go away from these edges of these cells, it, it uh, becomes less directly east-west and, and, and less strong. Does that make sense? Does that answer your question? Okay. Other questions? All right, cool. Okay, so in reality, um, things are really, so, so, so th this is the simplified idealized version, right? In reality, things are quite complex. So, um, is this guy an animated? This guy's not animated. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I have some animated things I can show you guys, but, but <clears throat> we have these broad patterns. In this case, we're looking at surface waters is the color, and then the arrows are representing, excuse me, surface temperature, SST is the color, and then the uh, arrows are representing the direction of the winds. So there's this tight relationship between winds near the surface and surface temperature, but it's not a perfect thing, right? That there, there, there's, there's flibs and flobs and gyres that spin out and around. So it's a complex system. Partly what's going on is we have these things like the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, we have these continents, we have these other things that are going to get in the way of most of the, the, the wind, water, interaction, circulation. There's only one place in the world where wind or air and water can move around unimpeded by land. And that's right here. It's right between the Antarctic Peninsula and the tip of South America, Tierra del Fuego. So this area is called the Roaring Forties, even though it's not technically 40 degree latitudes. Um, but um, the craziest oceans in the world are there. Because if we have the, you can imagine if we have the winds whipping around, whoosh, so here, the winds are whipping, and even if they're coming straight west or east or whatever, they're, they're over the water. As we've talked about, water is one temperature, land is another temperature, so that's going to mess with the, you know, tend to act to, to mess with at least the, the um, near surface winds, right? There's mountain, ra mountain ranges, things like that, that are going to mess with stuff. Here, there's nothing. Here, the wind can just be whipping up and whipping up and whipping up and whipping up and whipping up. So, for example, that explains why we have the ozone hole in South America, or in, uh, excuse me, not in South America, the ozone hole in Antarctica, which we'll talk about uh, in, the, in a little bit. Um, so, yeah, these are the craziest. You don't really ever want to go here if you don't have to, right? Um, and when people do these global racing events and sailing around the world, or I'm going to row around the world, this is always uh, short of hitting a hurricane somewhere or something like that. These are always the most dangerous times for those racers or those people doing that stuff. Um, is this guy going to play? This guy's not going to play. So, okay, that one's not going to play either. Okay, these guys aren't rendering properly, but, but you guys can see the still images at least. So again, we have a tr one of the things that's really blown up since, since World War II, but really since the early 1970s, is this global network of weather satellites, right? NASA has a tremendous number of weather satellites up, as do other countries. And uh, even though we like to defund NASA because some people think they um, believe in science, unfortunately. Um, but, uh, but in any event, we have this incredible network that we've, you know, in the last couple decades, it's hard to explain how, how revolutionary this has been for our understanding of our atmosphere and our oceans. But we essentially have, in most cases, real-time consistent monitoring of the goings-on of our planet. And with additional sensors that go up every few years, we get additional ways to measure things that heretofore we'd, we would have only uh, dreamt of or had to go up in an airplane or a hot air balloon or something like that to to sample and so yeah right okay um, I'll just mention that uh, again reiterate I'm showing mostly two-dimensional images for you guys but do realize this is a real three-dimensional process we have Coriolis effect we have water masses we have 
stuff sinking at the poles, rising at the tropics. So we have this really cool, amazingly complex global system of water moving around, of air moving around, of heat being transferred from one section of our globe to another section of our globe. It's really pretty crazy. Um, but to look at one subset of this, for example, one of the areas that's been uh, perhaps uh, studied the most is this gross circulation. So um, our ocean is mixed. In some cases, it might take a long time, thousands of years potentially for a water molecule, depending on where we're starting from, to get to the surface or, or the bottom of the ocean. But um, it, is a, it, is, um, it is a mixing system, okay? Again, much slower than lakes and things like that, but, but it is mixed. And so generally what we see happening is we see water from the, pole, from the um, cold polar areas going down. Now, up here, it's cold. Up here, there, is, there are not a ton necessarily of phytoplankton. And there's, there's not a huge massive amount, let's say during the winter, there isn't a massive amount of things eating plankton. So we have maybe some dead bodies and dead plankton material, dead biomass, let's say, right? So generally speaking, the water that's sinking from the polar regions is cold and nutrient rich and oxygen rich. Generally speaking, the tropical waters are oxygen poor, are warm, and are generally, doesn't have a huge amount of biomass in it. So that's why it's such good visibility. That's right. That's why it's so clear. Exactly. Exactly. So water at the poles is generally Richer. So it doesn't have No, water at the poles is massively clear. So the, the best visibility ever in my life was underneath the Antarctic sea ice. And that's where it sinks. That's right. It's right. There's, there's not, there's, there's not, there's, this is, a, this is always relative what I'm speaking here, right? There's life in every drip of water, but, but we're talking relative amounts here. In the poles, it's colder. We just don't have as much biological activity. We, I mean, we can have blooms of things. We can have amazing biomass and concentration, but on average, we take the whole mass, everything together. There's not as many critters in that little drop of water. Because it's cold. That's right. Well, there's not as much sunlight. So there's not as much sunlight on the year over. I mean, now, now during the austral or, 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 or during the um, spring melt, which we'll talk about later, yeah, it can be incredibly productive and the visibility can go to almost nothing. But, but the, the, we're talking about the average condition here for this, this intro discussion. On average, there's not much biomass up there. It's cold. And when things do grow, they tend to grow slower on average than they do in the tropics. So it's all relative. Remember, it's all relative. This is all relative, all these things I'm saying. So, so generally speaking, when we have some, some uh, cold, nutrient-rich rich waters sinking out of the photic zone in the polar areas, coming down, and then we have this deep water. And when that water gets brought up because of usually it hits some discontinuity, it either hits, you know, I don't know, it hits... Antarctica or it hits a continent or whatever, that can induce an upwelling. And so when that upwelling, when that stuff that was down comes up, it brings to the surface nutrients, oxygen rich, cool waters. And that tends to lead to really productive things. So, so we have uh, these, so not only do we have these areas that are these gyres and that kind of stuff, but again, those gyres that I showed you, remember, those are mostly two-dimensional phenomenon. That was the surface temperature. That was the surface wind. The ocean is, how deep is the ocean, you guys remember, on average? Um, six miles. Six miles. Six miles. 
three, 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 three to four kilometers, a little, a little deeper than three kilometers on average, right? So this is a large volume. So what's going on here is this funky conveyor belt is coming down and it's because, so it's, it's responding to the continents, right? So this water is sinking at the poles, boop, 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 boop. it's going down, it's coming down because there's, there's no continent in be between us here in the Atlantic. It's going down essentially this, this uh, mountain range underneath the Atlantic Ocean. Coming down, it hits Antarctica, and it's like, damn, and it breaks off. Boosh. So it kind of knocks this way. And then it, it's, a little bit of it goes this way. The rest of it kind of comes this way. And then, and then, bang, goes up this way, comes around, and they mix. And so this is this, this crazy mixing uh, conveyor belt. This is what that looks like. Okay, so red is relatively warmer, shallower water. Blue is relatively colder, deeper water. And this is one part of that circulation. So this is one node of this. Uh, this is why, um, uh, so does anybody know what we call the, the, the big surface current that goes from the Caribbean up along the eastern seaboard? Anybody know what we call that? The Gulf Stream, that's right. Anybody know who named the Gulf Stream? Or who first? So, 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 so I'll leave you with that. It's one of, one of our founding fathers of our country. I'll, leave, I'll let you guys uh, figure that one out. So, so why don't you Google who, who first uh, quantified and named the Gulf Stream. Anyway, it was an old dude, but um, you guys can figure out his name. So, okay, so this was key um, to, uh, you know, for example, trade in the, in the colonial days of our country. Um, this is what might happen with climate change. So that's the sort of current condition. Ah, oh, we melt some glaciers. So if we melt enough of the Greenland glaciers, and some people say we might be beginning to get close to this, such that this might happen in the next few decades, possibly. Maybe, maybe not, but, but it's at least... It's, it's definitely theoretically possible. It's absolutely theoretically possible. Whether it, it, it exactly comes out this way or not, um, we're not entirely sure, but every year it seems to be more likely. What, what have we done here? Check it out. We had this, this was a glacier, right? We added water, cold water, and what happened? Right, so, so just like we saw before, we had that that water mass, a different density of water, acted as, as if, even though it's, it's quote unquote water, it acted like as, as if it's something different, it's a different mass. It's like a, a mountain, if you will, inside the ocean. And so what we've essentially done, or what we, what we are working, our society is working extremely hard to do, is we're really trying to screw with this ocean circulation. It's very clear. Um, so this freshwater lens would act as a blump, you know, as a big, as a big sledgehammer, as a big deflection a shield and, and not allow the water to do what it has traditionally done. I mean, it'll, it'll obviously move. It's not, the water's not going to stop moving, of course, but it's going to go something, it's going to be different and it's going to break down the strength of that conveyor belt. This was the dream, one of the many insane dreams of Hitler. Hitler absolutely was trying to figure out how to do this, had people working on this. Oh, good question. Why? Yeah, what, say, Aspen? Uh, he wanted to freeze, he wanted to freeze England. He wanted to freeze the UK. Because check it out, right? So we have, we have this, um, because of this, this is, I mean, we're still, we talked about, we're pulling down this cold water, right? But, but it's warmer it's warmer than it otherwise would be, right? If we didn't have this circulation. So we have some of this warm water, it's cooling off, it's cooling off, it's cooling off. So he wanted to freeze Great Britain. So he was trying to figure out how to screw with the Gulf Stream. So obviously that was too big a task in the 1930s, 1940s. But good news, we figured out how to, how to do it, right? Yeah, but it's Hitler. He wasn't thinking. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. Right. That's right. That's right. 
So the point is, these basic physical properties that we've been introducing here have dramatic potentially influence, <clears throat> dramatic effects upon our management and our management decisions. What we choose to do and what we choose not to do have potentially long-reaching impacts, a lot of which we can trace, or, or the, the origins at least, we can trace back to the underlying structure that comes from our physiochemical plan, uh, uh, aspect of our global ocean and planet. Um, and so here's a little bit about upwelling. So we, we talked about before about, uh, so here we have this cold, deep water mass. This is the classic way we get upwelling. We have winds blowing off the continent, shoving that water away from the surface. And so as that water shoves away from the surface, something has to rush in to replace it. And, with, and in the upwelling context, that comes from the water down deep. And why did my thing stop working? Wow, that was, that was a dramatic video. <laughs> so the wind's going to come blow. And, oh, there we go. So the water, the, the cold water gets drawn up. In this case, we're talking about uh, off of Peru. Oh, there we go. Okay, I, I see it. The blue water is in the surface. So now we have this, all this deep, oxygen-rich water. Oh, my God, it's in the sunlight. Oh, my God, the plankton go crazy. Plankton bloom, boom. Plankton bloom, boom. Zooplankton bloom, feeding off the phytoplankton. Boom, zooplankton, boom. Oh, my God, anchovies, boom, they go crazy. Oh, my God, the anchovies go crazy. The, the you know, tuna go crazy. And so the, this, this huge productivity is in the areas uh, that we see consistently where we have these massive uh, traditional fisheries around the planet because of the physics, because of the underlying currents and, and that kind of stuff. Does that happen in the Gulf or is it more... Uh, sorry, does, does this happen in the Gulf? Yeah. Uh, it happens, uh, but... Um, in the Gulf of Mexico, not, not as dramatic because we don't have a massive pool of cold water. Yeah. But, but anytime, anytime you have consistent wind blowing off uh, for more than a few hours, blowing off sh offshore, uh, you'll tend to get the deeper waters pulled up. So we would call that an upwelling, whether it was, deep, whether it was cold ocean water or not. That's just a... a, a if so if you're in your hot, if you're in your bathtub and be careful with this one right but if you're in your bathtub and you turn your hair dryer on the water and blew it on the surface <laughs> without dropping your hair dryer in the water right that's going to shove that that's those surface water molecules towards i don't know towards your toes right towards towards the other end of the tub and the deeper water in the tub is going to bite it just has to right it's going to come up so that's an upwelling so anything that, whenever that happens, that is technically speaking an upwelling, although we, we classically use it to describe um, uh, very productive waters, but yeah. Okay. And so sometimes you'll hear people say, talk about cold water upwelling to distinguish between what Vanessa was just asking about from like these kind of things. Okay. So let's just look at some uh, surface currents here. And so again, uh, boom, boom, boom. So we're condensing a couple months, a, co a couple years. And so you can see... Uh, now, the length of the arrow is the strength of the movement. So again, we, we see that there's the exact equator is pretty boring, right? Because the, air, because the um, air is basically, the wind is going straight up, basically. So we don't have that many, um, or the, we don't have that much movement right or left or east or west. Once we get a little teeny bit away from the equator, check it out, right? A little teeny bit away from the equator, then we get these really strong winds. So if you were a sailor, you'd want to be right, you know, on here or right on here, depending on what time of year we're at. And that's where we get the most consistent winds, the fastest winds, and uh, the most, uh, will most uh, quickly get us to our destinations. So even today, even today with our, with our, uh, um, you know, fossil fuel powered shipping, I, ch I check those ones out. Oh my God, it's crazy. It's crazy. Um, uh, our, our major shipping fleets still use these same exact surface currents, right? Because they, because it's, it's cheaper, right? You use less fuel, you go faster. So even though um, we've mostly left the age of sail, we still utilize, and then these are the most popular uh, places to move our um, goods and services. Okay. Um, just about done here, but I'll just say that, uh, again, there's lots more complexity to all these things. This was just a really quick, gross introduction to these things. But 
Um, suffice it to say, um, there's all kinds of neat stuff that go on that, go, that, that, that occurs in the ocean. We have things like Ekman spirals, and we can get these. So here we go. Um, we can imagine in this case, this is a cartoon version, but here we have some surface waters moving in a, in a current. Boom, 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 boom. And in this case, uh, this is the um, um, Atlantic in the, in the northern hemisphere. Uh, here we go. We can get a, a water, a warm water mass and a cold water mass. So warm water, because check it out, this chunk of water is closer to the tropics. This chunk of water up here is closer to the poles. This is cooler. This is warmer. And when we get strong deformations of some of these consistent currents, when they get to the point where they're so deformed, j same exact process as when we see a river, like say the Colorado River. That. Yeah, it's exactly. Well, yep, 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 exactly the same thing. So we call, the, if, we're, if we're looking at a river, we would call this a gooseneck is the typical term that we would apply to this. But it's the same phenomenon, whether the water molecules are moving over dirt or the water molecules are moving other, over other water molecules. And so, so this guy's coming along, do 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 do, and then if he gets so so distended that a little bit of water, oh, and then just makes the jump here, and it effectively cuts off a water mass, and these can persist for weeks or sometimes even months, although more typically weeks, but we have this water, and it's still spinning. It's spinning. It's like rims. The rims are spinning on the cut. So it's spinning, 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 and in effect has a distinct, we're talking now about the surface waters here, the, 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 the shallow waters, a distinct mass has been separated and is now bubbling along uh, its, its uh, you know, the, a coastline, say. So we can get both warm water masses drifting along, we can get cold water masses drifting along. This is incredibly important. As we'll see when we talk about fisheries, fishermen figured this out. Unfortunately, <laughs> these transition zones hold things like fish, like um, uh, uh, a phytoplankton. And so this, so not so much inside or outside, but especially right on the transition, those areas tend to be where things accumulate, where flotsam and jets, where, 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 where pieces of trash and logs and stuff accumulates. Right underneath the log is where the little fishy that was like, what, I want to hide, and oh my god, here's a log, I'm going to go hide underneath that log, accumulate. That's right where the things that want to eat the little fishies accumulate. So this structure in the, so the ocean is incredibly structured. Even though to our often uneducated, unaided eye, we maybe don't see that structure. Now, you can see this with that satellite technology I was just showing you. Whereas back, if you and I looked at the ocean, maybe we couldn't see that this was a warm water, because this may be only a few degrees difference, perhaps. Um, it could be a lot more, but it's generally speaking just, you know, a few degrees or so. Um, so uh, we maybe couldn't see that from our boat, but the satellite tells us where it is. And we type that in and our GPS takes us right to that point, And we can slaughter those tuna in an at an unprecedented rate. So things like these currents have strong uh, an understanding how these currents move and understanding how organisms interact with, these, with this physical world has strong implications for how we manage those resources, how we exploit those resources, etc. Um, and we've already uh, talked about how this stuff all comes together to form things like hurricanes and stuff. But... Um, yeah, so there we go. So all this stuff comes together. There's all kinds of other things we'll talk about. Well, we need to talk about El Nino this year in particular and how that plays into this. But um, as far as our, our uh, introduction, that's basically it. Um, note that there is some significant daily variations of things we haven't talked about. There, are, there is this existing spatial and annual variation. There are other timescales. We will talk about El Nino. That's what this is, and so El Nino's Southern Oscillation. We also have the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. We now have recognized the North Atlantic Oscillation. El Nino is a phenomenon, as you'll learn, that typically repeats every 7 to 11 years in the Pacific Ocean. It has strong potential impacts on our weather and climate. The Pacific Decadal Oscillation is more on the order of 20, 30 years or so. 
of a of a shift. The so so these things can be on so these phenomena are on the scale of years to decades, but they have strong influences on our stuff, and all this stuff comes on, it, it, and, and we go on and on and on. So all these kind of things we'll be talking about uh, as we continue on. All right, great. So there's our introduction to physical oceanography and our, our glance at the ocean.